from Bang Bang and his wife from Malang. I was already thinking I have to go and visit them and then what a pleasant surprise. So I'm really excited to be here to see you guys again. Um, I don't feel like I'm a guest, you know. I, I feel like, like I belong here and so I praise God for you guys. I praise God that I can be here. Praise God that I can share uh, God's word with you. And I praise God that I get to interact with one of you once again. Okay, we're going to start our message. Um, we're going to start our message, and our message is entitled Christ Holistic. Christ Holistic. So if you would, would you please, would you kindly bow your heads, close your eyes, and I would lead us in prayer. Our everlasting God, Today, Lord, we come to you as a church once again. We are asking you for your Holy Spirit. We are asking you, Lord, that you would please bless us, that you would speak to us, Lord, that we may get out of that routine and that habit of formalism and that for these next few moments, you may come in contact with us. Father, we pray that this may not just be something theoretical and that we may leave with new facts. But at the same time, we pray that it may not be something that is just moves upon our emotions and then we come down from that emotional high. We ask you, Lord, for a conviction. We ask you, Lord, for a change and a transformation in our hearts and in our lives. And Father, I thank you because I know that you have heard this prayer not because I deserve it, but because Christ deserves it. And with that assurance, we go forward studying your word. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Our title for today is Christ Holistic. I'd like to share a principle with you, and I believe that if you can understand this one principle that the rest of the study for today will be simple to understand. You will be able to understand all the message all the way through. The principle is that when you look at a truth, at a doctrine in the Bible, it is often that this truth has two dimensions. It is that it often has two faces, two paradigms. And that's what I like to study with you today. We're going to look at a few examples. I want you to look at the cross. And, you know, I was, uh, I was reminded that we do not have to state the obvious or give proof for the obvious things. And so I'd like to draw your mind, if you don't know the verse, John 3.16, but I believe that all of us know John 3.16. It is that it is evident that God loves us. And that he would go so far to, 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 to display that love that he would send his own son to die. For God so loved the world. I don't know what happened to me. I don't know what happens. I'm a, I'm a first time father. But when I had my son, I remember that my, my wife was doing something else and I was carrying him and I began to sing hymns. I'm not sure if this is scientific or not, but I'm guessing that when you have a baby for some reason your estrogen levels go up specifically in men because when I begin to sing the hymns about about Jesus and, and God giving his son to die for us I would get really emotional like never before I was like what's wrong with me I'm a man you know I shouldn't be crying about this kind of stuff and I was just singing and holding my son because I would think I don't know that I would sacrifice my son or give my son for any other person let alone for someone that deserves to die. I've always thought that if I were to have the opportunity, if, if someone were to say, bro, I'm going to die, can you please, can we exchange? And I always thought I would calculate and I would look at that person and see what kind of person are you? How much good would you do? Because I want a return on my investment. It better be a high return. And if you're like, well, I'm a drug addict and I don't work, and I don't even believe in God, I would probably say, I'm going to pass. And probably give my life to someone else that would be more effective. But when you look at Christ, Christ didn't do that. Christ looked at the lowest human being, and when he saw him, he was still willing to die and to suffer for that individual. 
John 3.16, right? But there's another aspect. John 17 says that the Father himself, John 16 says that the Father himself loveth you. John 17 says that he loves you even as he loves me. So the Father's love for you is equal to the, fa- to the love of Jesus. But turn your Bible with me. Go, come with me to Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at verse 32. Romans 8 and verse 32, we are looking, the principle that we're trying to identify, looking at the cross, is that it's two-dimensional. That is the principle. That there are two faces. Are you in Romans chapter 8? If you're there, please say amen. All right. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up, For us all. When you look at the cross, you see the great love of God. But you also see the great hate of God. Where you see the great mercy and the great patience of God, the the great endurance of God for a sinful humanity. But on the other aspect, you see the great judgment of God. That his hate is so great that even if sin were to fall upon his son, he would still destroy him. So the cross has two aspects. It has an aspect of love, an aspect of grace, an aspect of mercy. But it also has an aspect of judgment, of wrath, of hate. Can you see it from the Bible? If you see it, say amen. Some of you guys don't see it, huh? Okay. It's all right. We're going to try again. Let's look at another example from the Bible. Whenever you ask an Adventist, especially, I'm not sure about it in Indonesia, but in the U.S., whenever we are doing an evangelistic series and we're trying to show that the law is still applicable to our days, we talk about sin and what is sin. And every good faithful Adventist knows the definition of sin. It's found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Anybody knows what that is? What is sin? Some of you guys are looking at me like I'm weird. Okay, let's go to 1 John. Never mind. Let me not make assumptions. 1 John. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. I'm waiting for some of you. I'm happy that you guys have your physical Bibles, even though you guys move slow, it's okay. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Are we there? If you're there, what do you say? All right. The Bible says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the what? The law. Sin is transgression of the law. So here is a biblical definition of what sin is. And this is what we call a sin of commission. In other words, it is a sin in action. It is something that you do. And when you break the law, if I were to come up to you and I were to kill you, that would be an active sin, a sin of commission, something that I actively did. But remember the principle. That it is often found that in the Bible... There are two phases to a truth. Are you following me? I, I'm used to teaching slow people, so no problem. If you're slow, we'll take this slow. We'll go little by little. If you follow me, say amen. Okay, if you don't follow me, just pray for yourself. We're going to get through this, okay? First John chapter 3, we have the sin of commission. But now let's look to a, 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 another text that is familiar But maybe we don't always think that this is the definition of sin. We're going to go to James. James chapter 4 and verse 17. James chapter 4 and verse 17. Notice what James chapter 4 and verse 17. The title of our message is Christ Holistic. So we're getting there. James chapter 4 and verse 17. 
look at this other aspect of the definition of sin. James chapter 4 and verse 17, the Bible speaks and it reads, Therefore to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? Do you see the different definitions? You have in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, it says that there is a sin that happens like this where you do something, where you're active, where you participate. That is called a sin of commission in the Bible. But the Bible also goes as far and it says, well, that's not the only thing that sin is. Sin is also when you do nothing. In New York, there was a, there was a man. They had windows like this. There's all these, uh, all these apartments. Everybody's looking out of their window. They hear a man screaming and they see a man being stabbed to death like 40 times. And everybody is watching this man get stabbed and nobody calls the police. So far that the man that stabbed this guy in front of so many people ran away and got away free. And when they interviewed these people, they said, why didn't you call the police? He said, I thought someone else would do it. I thought that so and so, I thought the neighbor, I saw all these people looking, so I knew for sure someone else would call the police. And a man died there in front of hundreds of people. Because someone didn't have the nerve to do something about it. So, the people that were looking and did nothing to help this man is as guilty as the man that actually partook in the sin of killing. Do you understand? That there is a sin of commission and there is a sin of omission. Or what we would call there is something where you are active, you are, you are actively involved. And there is something where you are passively involved. If you see someone hungry, and you walk by them, and you have the resources to help this man, and you don't, biblically speaking, that is a sin. Because you neglected to help someone. That is just as bad as if you were to steal from someone. Okay, do we get it now? If you get it, say what? Okay, we got it. The church got it. Okay. This evening we're going to be uh, speaking about health. And when you look at health, I'm going to use this just to illustrate my point a little further. We're going to be looking at Christ in a bit. But when you look at health, you can see that health in a similar way. If I were to come to you today and I'm saying, Church, we have to stop eating meat. Let's not eat meat. We cannot eat meat. And they're like, man, Daniel keeps on nagging us. Let's stop eating meat. Okay, no more meat, okay? No more meat, not at church, not on Sabbath. None of the time throughout the week. And everybody's happy. And we think we are more spiritual now. Like, whew, we came up a little bit higher. And everybody, see, the problem with this is that somebody might leave from church thinking, I am now a health reformer. I am now partaking of the health message. But that is only one aspect of health. The aspect of, of health is that I will abstain, or I will be passive, I will refrain from eating something. But you don't know how many fat health reformers I've met in my life. How many health reformers I've met that have died from diabetes and cancer and high blood pressure and so many things. You don't know how many health reformers I've met that hate vegetables. I'm like, bro, your diet is called vegetarian. It tells you what you should be eating. But, but I don't eat meat. Not eating vegetables does not equal to being healthy. Excuse me, not eating meat does not equal to being healthy. Do you understand that? That that aspect of health is just what you don't do. But that's not health. That there's another aspect that it tells you what you should be doing. You should be eating vegetables. You should be eating fruits. You should be drinking water. You should be getting rest. You should be exercising. And it is when you focus on one aspect, where some people focus on what I should not do, that's only one aspect of that message. And where other people say, well, I'm going to do and I'm going to do, that's another aspect. I want to show you this. This is a rupiah, that I found this in my wallet, this is 5,000. You guys can see it, right? Now watch this, okay, it's not a magic trick, don't worry, I'm not a magician. 
But look at this. If I were to give you 5,000, let's say 100,000, I'll get you more excited. If I were to give you 100,000, the 100,000, when you look at it, it looks like this. What would you conclude? Can you see it? Some of you guys are blind, huh? Okay, I'm going to tell you. There is a, fi the, there is a, a funny face on this, on this bill. And when you turn it around, guess what? There's another face on there. If someone were to give you a bill, and it, on both sides it's a face, what would you conclude? It's a fake. It's a counterfeit, right? And what I'm here to tell you today is that when you practice health in that way, it's a counterfeit. But we're not talking about health. That's until AY, right? But when you look at the Bible, and, and we're taking it to Christ, when you look at Christ in one dimension, in one aspect, it's a counterfeit gospel. What do I mean? See, often the time when we look at Jesus, we look and we think about Jesus. He was gentle, he was kind, he was loving, he was patient, he was merciful, he was... And we're like, oh man, he was the Lamb of God. And praise God for that. I'm not downing that. And we need that. Amen. But so many times we focus our attention on the Lamb of God that we forget that He is a lion from the tribe of Judah. And all these people are thinking that they have Christ and that they have the truth, when in reality they have a one-sided gospel. When they have this one-sided image, they have a counterfeit gospel and a counterfeit Christ. And so today I want to motivate you to look at Christ in a holistic way. Because Christ was not just gentle. This is what we call the active virtues of Christ. I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, that Jesus was also bold. That Jesus was brave. That Jesus was persevering. That Jesus was, had a high energy. He was determined. Do you see him at Gethsemane? He has to go to the cross. Now, if you, I mean, just compare Jonah with Jesus. Jonah, God says, go and preach a message. Just preach. And this brother takes off the opposite way. He said, you got to go to Jakarta. This brother's in Bandung. He goes to Papua. He's like, all you have to do is preach. Jesus, God tells him, you're going to go, you're going to get beaten, they're going to pull your beard, they're going to put a crown of thorns on your head, they're going to give you nails through your hands and through your feet. And the Bible says that in Gethsemane, Jesus fell and he got up and he fell and he got up, that he was resisting sin so much that, that blood began to, to pour down his face. He was sweating great drops of blood. Jesus was called on a mission and he says, I'm going to do it even if it kills me, even if they're going to beat me. This is the active virtues of Christ. I want to remind you of Matthew 23 where he talks to the pastors and he says, hypocrites. That takes a lot of boldness. So when you look at Christ, we get this principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. And the principle that we draw from that verse is that by beholding, we become changed. In other words, by, by what you focus on and what you look at and what you meditate, that is what you will be like. Why do we have so many half-baked Christians in our church? Why is it that we have so, so little power in our church? I want to submit to you that it's because our focus is very narrow. We always focus on Jesus Christ and how patient and how loving and how kind he was. And we forget that Jesus was bold, that he developed also the active virtues of Christianity. These are what we call the passive virtues of the Christian faith. And here you have the active virtues of the Christian faith. And if in that principle, it says that as you look and as you meditate on Jesus, you will be transformed into His image. But what if you're looking at the right thing from the wrong angle? If you're looking at Christ in a very narrow way, you will also become a counterfeit or a fake Christian. Do you understand? If you understand, say Amen. Hey, you don't really like that, huh? 
What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that in order for us to be like Christ, to not be half-baked Christians, to not become hypocrites, we must have a right perspective of Jesus. We must understand that Jesus was not just love and mercy and kindness. We must understand that Jesus was also active, diligent, bold. And when you get this perspective, the problem is this, that when you look at Jesus one-sided, then in order for you to know who I'm supposed to be, because I'm a Christian, then I must know who Christ is. And if you're looking at Christ in a very narrow or one-angled way, then you're going to be an unbalanced Christian. And so the problem is this, that we need to take a step back and we need to look at Jesus in a holistic way and who he was. And there are people today that need to develop some of the active virtues of Jesus. But there are other people that need to develop the more passive virtues of Jesus. And I don't know which camp you're on, but as you look at Christ, he can balance you out. He can make you a true and genuine Christian. I want to tell you something, friends. This is, I believe that this is one of the reasons why we have this controversy in the church where people focus so much on the love of Jesus, on the mercy of Jesus, that they, they develop this cheap grace, liberal love on one side. And then you have these other people that are focusing so much on the strong attributes of the law and of God, and then you develop this legalistic, conservative Christianity. We have to stand for the truth, amen, but not without love. And we shouldn't be condemning people to hell, but the Bible does say you should know them by their fruits. Do you remember our key text? Our key text tells us in Psalms 85, I, I'd like to illustrate this a little bit further and then we'll move on. By the way, I'm almost done. Psalms 85. Let's go to Psalms 85. And I'd like you to see how David illustrated this. Psalms 85 and verse 10, the Bible says, Mercy and truth have met together. And so he is personifying mercy and truth. It is as if mercy is a female and truth is a male. And hey, what's your name? I'm mercy. What's your name? I'm truth. And they met and they end up getting into this relationship. And notice what ends up happening. Righteousness and peace, it's interchangeable, have kissed each other. It is as, as if these, this male and this female, they came together, they met, they liked each other, and they ended up kissing and ending up, ended up getting married. Jesus says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. It is when we separate grace and mercy, it is when we separate, when we have a one-sided view of Christ, that we get this counterfeit to the truth. This half-baked Christianity. I'm not sure if you know, but the disciples tried to rebuke Jesus in the book of Matthew, or in the gospel of Matthew, because they said to Jesus, Jesus, don't you know that you offended the Pharisees? Let me tell you what Jesus did not do. He didn't say, oh, okay, let me go back and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Jesus didn't do that. Now some of you guys are thinking, yeah, I need to practice some of that. Get some in someone's face and just tell them what I think about them and not say sorry. No, it's not what I'm talking about. But when it comes to prayer, I want to talk to this. I, I, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this a lot. I usually talk about why God doesn't answer uh, our prayers. You know, sometimes it's not good for us. And you've heard that, right? It's not the best. And God can give you something better. Or God says, wait. Or what, what not. And those things are true. But when you look at the Bible and you look at people praying. Let me give you an example. Elijah. God told him, in three and a half years, it will rain. Prophecy. God does not like it will happen. But Elijah knows. He says, hey. 
It's been three and a half years since it's rained. God told me it was going to rain. Elijah didn't just wait and say, Where, where's the rain at? He went up to a mountain, he prayed. And he prayed one time, and there was no rain. And he prayed two times, and there was no rain. He prayed three times, and there was no rain. Elijah could have been like, you know what? This is a false prophecy. I got it wrong. You know, my, my, my prophetic antenna was a little bit off. And, but he says, no, I know that God said, said that it will rain. And so he prayed seven times, and on the seventh time, it finally rained. There are some times where we pray and we know it's God's will. Let me give you an example. If I pray and I'm asking God, do you want me to marry this young lady? There is no verse in the Bible or in the spirit of prophecy that says, this is the woman that you should marry. Marry her, go forward. No. There are some times where God's will is a little bit, I'm not so sure, ambiguous. But there are certain things like for forgiveness of sin overcoming sin, spreading the gospel. Certain things in the Bible that are just so clear that you know that God wants to answer that prayer. Let me give you an example. Maybe some of you have been praying for your sister, your mother, your co-worker, your boss, and it's been one year and they don't budge. Two years and it seems like they're getting worse. And you know that it's God's will that everybody may be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and yet nothing. For some people, they say, well, yeah, like just let it go, and I just forget to pray about them. I mean, I guess they don't want to, that's, that's on them. And then we stop praying for them. But there are some people, like my father, my father was praying for me for tw fifth, how much? 15 years. He would pray and pray and pray and pray and he would not give up. I believe that God does not answer prayers today right away because he's trying to develop in you the active virtues of Christ. That you would agonize, that you would be like Jacob and say, Lord, I will not let you go. To the point even that Jacob got hurt and he says, I'm still not going to let you go. Bless me, Lord. That takes determination. And God wants you to develop that. We as Adventists know Revelation 14, right? The three angels' messages. And do you remember that it says... Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Revelation chapter 12, excuse me. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, right? Revelation 14 says, Here are they, here are the patients of the saints that keep the commandments of God. I want to, I want to help you understand that that word, that's old English. What does that mean? Here's a patience. And we, it, it almost seems like, oh, here are these gentle little Christians that, you know, go ahead and endure everything. Someone slaps them, they give them the other cheek. That word means, here is the endurance of the saints. They endure. Why? Because the dragon is following them. He's making war against them because there's a persecution. That they're so enduring that at all costs, they want to keep the commandments of God. Whether you kill them, whether you torture them, whether you take their salary, they will not budge. Here are the endurance of the saints. Let's open our Bibles. Today I am focusing more on the active virtues of Christ. Let's open our Bibles really quick to Matthew chapter 15. And I, I'd like to share a story with you. And I think that most of us, most of us are familiar with this. Matthew 15 and verse 22 in closing. Matthew 15 and verse 22, the Bible talks about this lady from Canaan. It says, in verse 22, the Bible says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. This lady is not a Jew. She's not a believer. She is a Gentile. She comes unto Jesus. She's a Canaanite. A pagan. And she, she's in desperation. She says, I'll do whatever it takes to heal my daughter. 
So she hears about this man named Jesus. And as she goes to Jesus, she says, Lord, help me. Well, here's the problem. That the Jewish leaders would teach racism. They would discriminate against other people that were not Jews. And so they would call them unclean animals, like pigs and dogs. And we don't associate that. We don't touch them. We don't come in contact with them. We don't share food with them because they are unclean. And in verse 23, you, you see this displayed by the pastors of Christ church. Now these are the men that are going to be in charge of the GC in Jerusalem. These are going to be the conference pastors. And I want you to see how they think and how they act. In verse 23, And he answered her not. He answered her not a word. And his disciples came and sought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. So there's a crowd, Jesus healing people. This lady comes, and Christ ignores her. Have you ever felt like that? You're crying out to God? You're in a desperate situation. God, help me. And you feel like God is ignoring you? Well, you weren't, or you're not the only one. And then what makes it even worse is that these guys are kind of ashamed to be, to be associated with this lady because she's a heathen, she's an unclean animal. And they're like, Christ, should we, should we just tell her to go away? She, you know, she's calling after us. And, and even though Christ ignores this lady, and even though the future pastors, the future leading pastors of Christ's church discriminate her, notice what she does. No, notice what he, uh, Jesus says to her. 24, And he answered and said, I am not sent unto the lost sheep, of the house of Israel. Am I not sent unto the last sheep of the house of Israel? In other words, isn't it my mission to bless the Jews? That's the response. Maybe I'm here for someone better. Maybe I'm here for someone else, but I don't think it's my mission to reach out to you. Verse 20, 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. I think about our church today. That it is often the case that someone looks at you in a different way. Someone forgets to say hi or say, Happy Sabbath. I'm not going to that church anymore. They don't even offend you. This lady was discriminated by the leaders of the church. This lady was ignored by Jesus Christ. And what does she do? She falls down and worships the man that ignores her. Take it a little bit further. 26. And he answered and said, Is it not meat? It is not meat. It is not fit. It is not appropriate to take the children's bread or the children's food and cast it to dogs. If Jesus were to call you a dog... Would you worship him? So maybe Jesus didn't hear her the first time. Okay, well, the pastors ignored her and, and discriminated her. But then Jesus comes and insults her and says, I shouldn't be feeding dogs. Now my understanding is that in Indonesia, if you call someone a dog, it's a very bad word. Not in the U.S. My, my, my sister, when she was young, she said, Dad, you're so cute like that puppy. <laughs> and then I came to Indonesia and I was like, oh, yeah, we can't do that. We can't tell people that they're cute like puppies, you know, because uh, they're going to want to fight. So, yeah, I, I realize that zoos are, 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 you know, are forbidden here. You don't talk about monkeys and stuff like that because it's bad. And I never knew that. But my wife enlightened me that, no, no, you can't say stuff like that. That the baby's cute like a monkey, that's a no-no. And I was like, okay. But in this context, the oriental context, Jesus goes out and calls this lady a dog. I don't know about you, but for me, I think that would have been enough. I get the point. I'm not worthy of you. And I probably would have left. But not this lady. Notice in verse 27, and she said, Truth, yes, I might be a dog, Lord. 
Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She was displaying perseverance, determination. I'm not leaving until you bless me. You can call me a dog. You can ignore me. You can discriminate, discriminate me. But I'm not leaving until you bless me. Maybe for some of you this is hard to understand, but I want you to remember in Job. Job 28 and verse 10, it says, He know, he know, I'm going to just say it in easy English. He knows the way that I will take when he has tested me, that I should come out as fine gold. Job is saying like, God already knows what I will do. Even the test is not for God. God knows what the outcome already. The test is for you and for those looking. Jesus already knew what this lady would do and so he presses her and he pushes her and he's using her as an illustration against the Jewish. These people are asking for signs. These people are asking for bread. Oh, prove to me that you're the Messiah. And Jesus is doing everything in his power and yet they reject him. And yet this lady that is not a believer, this lady that is a heathen, this lady that is a pagan woman comes to Jesus. And Jesus pushes her and says, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you. I'm ignoring you. And then he says, you're a dog. And then she continues to worship Jesus and cries out to Jesus. Jesus was illustrating the active virtues of a Christian. Verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Do you see that? Often the time when I talk to missionaries, and I talk to, to, to these religious people, we often get this, this image that faith is doing nothing, that you just sit down, you pray for money, you pray for God's work, and that's faith. You didn't have to do anything. Now the great faith that this woman had, that she just pray and say, God, help me, heal me. Okay, God's going to do it now. No, she pressed, she moved forward, she did anything in her, within her power. She had obstacles, and yet she pressed forward to get the blessing of God. You know, I see so many successful he people here. When I came to Indonesia, I thought, man, Kasian, I got to come to these poor people and help them out. I came here, I was like, what in the world? These people live better than me. They have, they, some people where I live in the kampung, they own mountains. I was like, what in the world? Mountains. They sell one mountain, and you want another one? And when I came here, I learned that some of these people, some of the Asians in Indonesia are so persevering when it comes to their education. Am I right? Yeah, yeah that's right, that's me. They're so persevering when it comes to their career. But put them in the spiritual realm and say, Oh, I guess it's not God's will. If God's people were to use that diligence, that perseverance, and incorporate those principles that you use to study and to be successful in your career and in your business, and you put that into the church, and into your religious life, what do you think would happen? How fast would the gospel move forward? But it's because we look at Christ when it comes to spiritual things, He's a passive, gentle, merciful Savior. And so we adopt this belief and we're passive in the church. And we're passive when it comes to evangelism. And we're passive when it comes to prayer. Early writings, inspiration says that she asked the angel, why is there so little power in our church? The angel responds, it is because they let go of the hand of God so quickly. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, having done all to resist the devil. My question to you, if you are in a situation where you feel that God is not answering prayer, where God is not working on your behalf, where God is not giving you victory, 
where as you are praying and you're doing ministry, it's not succeeding. Is it possible that God is trying to develop those active Christian virtues in you? If you're struggling today, I want to encourage you that God is not forsaking you. But He wants to develop a holistic character for you. He wants you to develop, the, the, yes, the passive and the gentle virtues of Christ, but also those active virtues. We need that if we're going to go through the time of trouble. In our ministry, for several years we didn't have cold water. And you hear the girls and even the guys, we live in the mountains, it is cold. Early in the morning, take a cold shower, ah, it sounds like there was a persecution in the toilet. Some of you guys have never tasted some of that cold mountain water. You need to come and get ready for the time of trouble. Someone's going to be like, hey, I can't handle this cold water. Just give me, the, give me the mark of the beast and I'll go ahead and get my heater and take a warm shower. What I'm saying is this. What I'm trying to illustrate is, the Bible says it like this. If you can't even keep up with the foot soldiers, what makes you think you're going to keep up with the chariots? If something in the church discourages you so easily, I don't like how he preaches. Hey, this brother rebuked me. Oh, he doesn't say hi. And you're so quick to leave the church. You think you're going to go through the time of trouble with that? You are an unbalanced Christian. And the time that we look at those active virtues of Christ. Closing verse. We're going to Luke. Luke chapter 18. Jesus is giving a parable of a widow that has been treated unjustly. But the king, it is, he is an unjust king. He doesn't fear God. And the Bible says that Jesus gave this parable. Notice this. Why did Jesus give this parable in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1? And he spake a parable unto them to this end. In other words, he, he told them this parable for this reason, for, for this purpose. That man ought to always to pray and not to faint, not to give up. That's the purpose of this parable. And he says that this woman would come to the king and, and he just send her away. I don't care. I don't fear God. But then the king says, man, this lady is so persistent. She doesn't leave me alone. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You have children, right? And they're like, dad, can I have this? No. Dad, can I get this? No. Dad, come on. Dad, no. Oh, okay, man, just take it. Do you know what I'm talking about, right? With your children? The Bible says that we have to be children, cry, like children in faith. You see children, they'll even negotiate with you. And they'll press you and press you and press you until you finally say, I'll just give it to you. That's the experience that this king had. He said, not because I care about righteousness, not because I want to be just, but I just don't want it to bother me. And then she got what she wanted. Jesus said, that's the mentality that you should have when it comes to your spiritual walk. I'm not going to stop until you bless me. But what's interesting, did Jesus have fears? Did Jesus have concerns? I want to submit to you that he did. Notice what Jesus asked in verse 8. The closing question that Jesus asked, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Talking about the Son of Man coming to avenge those that have witnessed things that are not just in their life. Maybe traumas, abuse, harassment, rape, molestation, robbery. Jesus says, I'm going to get revenge. I will. He said, don't worry about that. But notice what he asked. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Why would Jesus ask that? He said, you know, I'm wondering. I'm wondering by the way that things are going, if there will be faith when I come back. Friends, I want to encourage you to press forward in your ministry, in your religious life, in your devotionals. Push 
develop those active virtues of Christ. When someone insults you or offends you, if you don't feel like God is answering your prayer, if you feel like God is ignoring you, if the pastor has discriminated you, if whoever, have that mindset. I will not let you go until you bless me. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I know that in our Christian journey, you said that it would be narrow. Lord, you said that in this world we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Father, we are asking you, Lord, in a special way, not only for Jizdak, but for our worldwide church, for our, ourselves, help us to develop those active virtues of Christ. Help us to do all within our power to move your work forward. And at the same time, Father, we ask you that you develop those passive, those gentle virtues in our life of kindness, of love, of humility, of patience, of, long, of love, long-suffering. Father, I pray that when you come back through Jesus Christ, that the Son of Man may find faith on this earth. And we ask you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.